Because I work with science. So, so I'm with the yeah, put in jail and like Gordon White is quite mistreated in New York. That's, that's what I'm doing. So as long as we're doing this, oh, and uh, and, uh, right. do, uh yeah, I was a lawyer. I was a lawyer. Okay, great. Well, okay. Make simple, simple short. complex litigation. I just knew I was in a lot of a lot of business schools. Okay, we're gonna get started. Um, thank you for coming tonight. Um, really happy that Josh was willing to um come up here for this. He's on a very busy book tour, and this was something. This is now, I think we've been here once before, right? So, the second time coming, um, and second book on the general topic of Obamacare. Mm -hmm. Um, ah, awesome. Well, can you go out and get the box? The gates of prayer to close no wrong. There you go. Um, so, Josh is a law professor at the Houston College of Law. He is from Staten Island. He is hawking his new book. <laughs> Ta -da! Can you pass it around so we can take a look at it while we? Absolutely, unravel. And you buy a copy of it. Well, exactly. <laughs> and if you I'm look like, at your invitation, a there's an Amazon time. link, so you should. Oh, and look. I'm just dead, so I can oh. do this. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was thinking you're New Jersey conservative. That's war. excellent. Well, Obamacare, so religious so liberty, so and executive power. Josh Blackman, um, you also are co-authoring with Randy Barnett, and also have a really cool article out in the Harvard Law Journal. Yes, yes, I don't have a laptop, so I have to thank Alita for lending me her computer uh, to use, <laughs> uh, during this presentation. It was it was not planned, but uh, she is a good sport. And she and and see, this is perfect, right? Because Josh Blackman is a genius and also forgets his laptop on the train. <laughs> I uh, I have everything else. The entire suitcase full of books, but my laptop is somewhere in the Amtrak Northeast corridor, oh. uh, or in Chinatown. I'm not sure which one. Exactly. Uh, we'll, we'll <laughs> but he couldn't have gone far. <laughs> Josh Blackman. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Pleasure to be here. I am again from Staten Island, so whenever I come to New York, I always like to, uh, to visit my friend Alita and others in this chapter. Um, we are here today, my friends, to discuss my new book, Unravel Obamacare Executive Power and Religious Liberty. And this book tells the story of the Affordable Care Act during its second act that is, from President Obama's inauguration in 2013 all the way to the present. Focusing on three, premium, uh, pre, uh, three primary Supreme Court cases, there was Hobby Lobby, which involved the contraceptive mandate. There was King v. Burwell, which Mr. Weinstein knows well, which involved whether you can have subsidies on the federal exchange. And you have the Little Sisters of the Poor case. So I want to actually begin our story way back when with a figure who remarkably is still in the public eye after 30 years. Yes, indeed, Hillary Rodham Clinton. She was still Rodham back then. She's since drop that uh, drop the middle name. In the early 1990s, uh, uh, Secretary, I'm sorry, Secretary Clinton, First Lady Clinton uh, and her husband proposed transforming our healthcare system to join the rest of the world to have a national healthcare system. It was called the Health Security Act um, and would have basically put the federal government front and center and now every single American get access to health insurance. Um, unsurprisingly, this bill proved to be unpopular, okay? Why? So who, who here remembers these commercials? <laughs> or oh, I remember their names. Harry and Louise. Harry and Louise. Bingo. Harry and Louise. Who are Harry and Louise? <laughs> You're going to like Josh in this room. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. who, who are Harry and Louise? Scary. Remember? What were they talking about? Yeah, they were going to the health insurance. Oh right. my gosh, on page 47, paragraph 2, it says, <laughs> we're all going to die. So <laughs> Harry and Louise had a very effective message. It was a ma and pa from some Midwestern town. And they were, I actually do remember this. I remember watching it. I was about 10 or 11. Um, and they had this you know, commercial, and they were saying, you know what? I don't want the government getting charged my health insurance. I like the insurance I have. I'd like to keep it. Within months after these commercials, it was on computer, it was on internet, within months after these commercials aired, the popularity of Hillary Care plummeted. Who, who sponsored those commercials? Health insurance lobby, of course. Okay. But within months of these commercials, Hillary Care was killed. Unsurprisingly, a key lesson was learned. If you want to reform health care, you have to make people think 
that they can keep what they have. It does not be true. Because we have this paradox, right? Before the ACA was enacted, roughly 85% of Americans were happy with their health insurance. That's a very high number. But about 70% said we need to improve the health insurance for everyone else. You can't have both. In order to improve health insurance for poor and sick people, you have to make it more expensive for everybody else. This is simple economics, a law of loss of people like Uber and others. There's this paradox, right? Insurance cannot be affordable, accessible, and comprehensive. You can pick two. If you want it to be affordable, it's got to be shoddy coverage. If you want it to be accessible, it's going to be expensive. You cannot have everything. But the president and his administration tried to resolve this dilemma with a simple promise that cannot be kept. A promise you repeated three dozen times. A promise you all know well. Everyone ready? If you like your plan, you can keep your plan, right? This, this was something that he repeated three dozen times. Oh, and, and, and it, yeah, exactly. And it wasn't just a pernicious lie. This was warping the culture of the United States to think that we can have health care reform without any sort of sacrifice. That we can have health care reform without screwing up what we already have. This was never possible. The only way that this law can operate was by, to use a Chris's word, spreading the wealth. Taking some from people who had good insurance and helping people who did not have it. This was a debate that never happened in 2009 and 2010. Why? We were spread the lie that we could keep whatever policies that we wanted. So what happened? The bill goes to the Senate. At the time, Majority Leader Reid, who saw two eyes at that point, um, had a bill goes to prove majority in the Senate. It's funny, did you see Donald Trump last week? They made some comment about Harry Reid, and Donald Trump said, well, maybe he's going to exercise with a rubber band piece of again. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to use another black guy for this talk. So when the ACA was first being debated in the Senate in 2009, the Democrats had a 60-vote majority, a bill was approved majority. And a decision was made very early on. The decision was this. We don't need a single Republican vote to pass this bill. We're going to go in a straight party line vote because Republicans wanted nothing to do with this health care reform. Okay. Once you make that decision, you're stuck with it because roughly half the country feels no ownership of the law and they had no problem trying to repeal it every 15 seconds and trying to kill it at every single turn. So you have this bill, the Affordable Care Act. It was 3,000 pages long. Um, no one read it. Um, it was literally impossible to read the entire thing in a time in which it was actually on the Senate floor to when it was voted on. In fact, Max Baucus, who was the chairman of the Finance Committee, admitted, he said, I pay people to read this sort of thing. What do I have to read you know, the bill that I'm actually voting on? But within this bill, there are lots of provisions that weren't quite ironed out. It wasn't meant to be final. This was merely a draft. This was meant to go back and forth from conference between one house and the other. But then something crazy happened. Senator Ted Kennedy had passed away that summer. And his replacement was Scott Brown, a Republican in Massachusetts. As a consequence of Scott Brown's election, the Democrats lost their filibuster proof majority. So that bill that passed on Christmas Eve 2009, which was never meant to be the final bill, became the final bill. And now the House, led by Speaker Pelosi, was effectively forced to vote on a bill that was incomplete, that had never been ironed out. And there were significant differences between the House bill and the Senate bill. But the House had to take it as they found it. They could not make any significant alterations because that was screwed up what's called this reconciliation process. So what happened? On March 23rd, 2010, sorry, March 22nd, 2010, the ACA passes the House. I want to draw your attention to one number that is not there. I have two. <laughs> 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 not a single Republican voted for the ACA. Not one. That was an arrogant decision to pass it in this manner. Because it simply presumed that once it passed, Republicans would simply fall in line and say, okay, you know what, Obamacare, we lost the battle. Let's go support it. In, in fairness, that's not a crazy idea about Republicans. No. Well, for, 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 for remarkable <laughs> reasons, Republicans have actually held solid. Yeah. on their steadfast opposition to the ACA. I think they felt cheated. So 
and the bill goes to the White House. President Obama is smiling at the signing ceremony. You can see there are 23 pens that she uses, uh, sorry, 23 pens that she uses to sign a signature. She does a little part of signature with each pen, so that way you can hand these pens out to coaches. Poison pens. Uh, uh, more like a poison pill, or a bitter pill in this case. So after the ACA was signed, it was immediately seized from every angle. The first challenge involved a constitutional challenge followed by Florida, Virginia, and host of other parties <coughs> testing the law's individual mandate. That is, can Congress compel people to buy health insurance? This was a subject of my first book, Unprecedented, uh, which is also on sale on Amazon. And, and, and this discussed whether Congress can make people buy insurance or make people buy broccoli. In the first case, where John Roberts broke my heart, which was not the last case, uh, the Chief Justice ruled that the, the Affordable Care Act's mandate should best be construed as a tax. And because we're construed as a tax, we can uphold it. This is how Obamacare will save the first go-around. After the ACA was upheld by the Supreme Court, it fell into the political arena. Mitt Romney, if you remember him, was actually running for president. It was like a lifetime ago. And Romney ran on the pledge repealing and replacing Obamacare. This promise, though, was entirely illusory. Why? As governor of Massachusetts, he basically invented Obamacare. Okay? His reform in Massachusetts, which is called Romneycare, had the key components of the ACA. And he was being advised by a man named Jonathan Gruber. Yes, indeed, the same architect who uh, 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 helped Mitt Romney went to the White House. So during the debate, Barack Obama called Mitt Romney the godfather of Obamacare. As we know, the polls were not so skewed, and uh, President Obama won re-election by a fairly comfortable margin. I would love to know what he and the Chief Justice were saying at this point. Uh, it was only a few months after the Obamacare law was upheld. We know that the Chief Justice had it written down that time. Yeah. The oath. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, we take any questions for the end? Sorry, sorry, sorry. sorry. No, it's yeah. okay. I, I realize I'm in New Jersey. People are more inclined to interrupt. Uh, but but I, promise, <laughs> I promise I'll have I'll have plenty of time for questions as long as you want me to stay. Thanks. <laughs> but the second major battle over the Affordable Care Act, once we got past the mandate, involved the contraceptive mandate. So at the time, one of the biggest debates within the ACA involved funding for abortion. And one of the key stumbling blocks to the president was will these pro-life Democrats, these blue dog Democrats, support the law if there's funding for abortion? The president signed this executive order in the White House saying, we are not going to fund abortion. Now, as you all know, executive orders are worthless, but they can be repealed in five seconds. But this was enough to assuage the consciences of people like Bart Stupat and others who pulled this up, this ironclad executive order that meant absolute zero. But there was misdirection, my friends. While all the attention was focusing on funding for abortion, the key battle focused on a provision no one paid much attention to which was Senator Mikulski's Women's Health Amendment. Now, in the ACA, there's a single sentence. Okay? It said, for women, employers must provide, quote, preventive care. What is preventive care? The statute does not define it. In fact, the member of Congress refused to define what preventive care means. So who gets to define what preventive care means? The Obama administration, of course. <laughs> This is what we call Chevron deference. Congress deliberately passes a phrase that's ambiguous, you don't know what it means, knowing full well that the bureaucracy will define it in the exact fashion that they could not do. So from this provision saying that for women you must provide preventive care, the Department of Health and Human Services, the Health Research Services Administration, and the Institute of Medicine, all these alphabet soup groups said, we will now require all employers to provide the full range of FDA-approved contraception. This includes things like Plan B and the morning-after pill. Again, none of this is in the statute. The statute is entirely silent about the provision of these sorts of drugs, but it covers the entire range of contraceptives. Now, this may sound great if you're a young millennial uh, who wants to get free birth control. In fact, this is an actual ad. Uh, I'll read it for you. It's in the of the room. It says, uh, uh, let's get physical. Own he's hot. My favorite. Thank you, my mom's not here. Uh, let's hope he is as easy to get as his birth control. <laughs> uh, 
This was an actual ad put on by a Colorado uh, nonprofit to try and promote Obamacare. But the flip side of making sure millennials like this, this, this young lady get birth control is who has to pay for it? Nuns. Yes, indeed. The original, the original contraceptive mandate did not exclude nuns. These are the little sisters of the poor. And because they don't work in a house of worship, they work in a, uh, a nursing home for the elderly, they would be required to provide their female employees with the morning after pill. Praise be to God, right? This was the, I keep using the word, arrogance of the Obama administration. They didn't realize that making a group of nuns pay for birth control might be a bad idea, right? That, that, <laughs> that didn't occur to them. They said, well, they're not a church. And, you know, if, they, if the nuns want to have, you know, their little nursing home and, you know, helping old people and hospice care, then, you know, they should make sure their, their female employees have, have condoms and, and other forms of birth control. Okay. This did not go over well, as you could imagine. And this actually was extremely controversial. So they issued a series of rulemaking and regulations so at first they said only houses of worship are covered. And they said, well, we'll also cover houses of worship that open their, their doors to the community. They said, well, okay, if you're a house of worship, you're exempted. But if you're a religious charity, you get something else. Okay, what do you get? We won't make you pay for the birth control. We will simply require the insurance company to pay for the birth control. However, we're going to use your plan, right? Your insurance plan and your insurance contract will be the vehicle, the conduit, through which you provide these products. And after several more rulemakings, they said, uh, 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 we're going we're gonna to require these religious groups to use this plan. All they have to do is fill out this form. Okay? Just fill out this form. Tell us who your insurance company is, and we will contact them for you and make sure that they provide this form of birth control. Okay, come on in. No worries. No worries. We're all friends. <laughs> But the problem is, once the nuns signed this form, the next step is birth control will be provided. The nuns argue that this makes them complicit in sin, right? That actually signing this form made them part of the sinful process of providing contraceptives to these employees. Now, the nuns didn't oppose, weren't opposed to their employees using contraceptives. They simply didn't want to provide it through their plan, this sort of hijacking measure. But this wasn't only a problem for nonprofits like the nuns. This also affected for-profit corporations like Hobby Lobby. We're going to pause and come back to religious, uh, religious liberty later and talk for a minute about the actual political fallout of the ACA during the fall of 2013. Excuse me, fall of 2013. Um, when I first started giving talks about this topic, I simply assumed that after Mitt Romney lost the election the, uh, to Alita's point, the, the, the blowout to Obamacare would simply fade away, and Republicans would more or less fall into line. Um, I was wrong. So during the summer of 2013, my junior senator and a federal society member, and he's still in good standing, uh, Ted Cruz barnstormed the nation with commercials on commercials with cable news saying we need to defund Obamacare, right? Even if we can't repeal it, we're going to take away all the funding for it. And so Cruz and Senator Lee hatched this plan. It was the plan was foolproof. It went like this. The continuing resolution, which funds the government, ended on September 30th. The Obamacare exchanges opened on October 1st. Oh, genius, right? If we cut the funding off at midnight on September 30th, Obamacare can't open. So what happened? The Republicans refused to approve a budget that included money for Obamacare. Most famously, Ted Cruz engaged in a 23-hour speech from the Senate floor. Um, it was not a filibuster, and this is a, 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 a contentious point. Um, a vote was scheduled the next day. Nothing Cruz could do could postpone that vote. So people say, wow, Ted Cruz filibustered and shut down the government. Not even close. Cruz's filibuster was a week before the shutdown even began. But his speech, where he read Green Eggs and Ham, told Dr. Seuss book, his speech where he read Green Eggs and Ham to his daughter from the Senate floor, uh, a galvanized Republican who said that, look, look at this beginning, uh, you can see his tie <laughs> came all the way down, right? <clears throat> Cruz's speech galvanized Republican opposition and fortified the House Republicans who said, okay, you know what? We are not going to fund Obamacare with this, you know, with this bill. So what happened? Did the government shut down? Uh, 
the most visible symbol of government shutdown for the federal parks that were closed. This is the World War II Memorial uh, in Washington, D.C. And you may recall that a lot of the vets, the honor flights, would go to Washington, D.C. To, to, to see the memorial in their honor were confronted by these gates. So what did the vets do? How like they did it in Normandy? They simply picked up the gates and dropped them across the street at the White House. Uh, uh, this went on for a few days. Um, if anyone ever listens to me, the quickest way of fixing the budget is making sure that federal parks stay open during government shutdown. That is the single biggest reason why people will close shutdown. Your social security checks keep coming. The mail keeps coming. All right, so some federal workers get furloughed. They have to whatever. Pay, pay them their salaries, right? But keep the damn parks open because you have these people going to Mount Rushmore, right? It's a mountain. <laughs> the park police actually barricaded a look-off on a state road <laughs> so people couldn't much. even pull over to look it's at the damn much. Mount Rushmore. This it's was meant much. to inflict maximum pain. <laughs> this is, even the state of Arizona is willing to, to from state money to keep uh, uh, the Grand Canyon open. And the Fed said, no, we won't do it. <laughs> Although, curiously, they, they allowed Andrew Cuomo to fund the Statue of Liberty and keep that open. So, but, uh, you know, that's... Uh, We'll talk about that later, perhaps. But the next big conflict, which was the debt ceiling. So it wasn't enough that we had a government shutdown. We were also approaching the limit of how much debt we can spend. And as often happens, Republicans caved. And they basically gave a full funding of the government, did nothing to beef on Obamacare, and perhaps even worse, they gave up the sequestration. The sequester is a way of cutting spending, but because Obama held all the chips, we got nothing. So. On October 1st, I'm sorry, October 17th, give or take, Obamacare was fully funded, the debt ceiling was, was lifted, sequestration was gone, and the entire shutdown was, frankly, for nothing. Um, uh, I, don't say that, I don't say that lightly, but it didn't achieve anything positive. It was actually a, a victory for the Democrats in more ways than one. Primarily, it was a distraction. Because on October 1st, as the government shut down, and the barricades went up. The website went down. Yes, our favorite, our healthcare.gov. This is Adrian. Um, Adrian uh, was an unassuming model, not even a model. She was a woman who re responded for a call for free headshots on the condition that the pictures would be used on the HHS website. She didn't know what the hell she was doing. Um, so she took these free headshots and she became the face of Obamacare. In fact, she was not even a US citizen. Unclear she was even eligible for Obamacare. She never used <laughs> uh, in, in fact, she went on Good Morning America and said that she was being bullied because people were taught rich. And, I love <laughs> but she was being bullied because of her endorsement. The problem was the website did not work. The website, <laughs> let's get her reaction there. After the website launch was an absolute disaster. It did not work. It became a nightmare. Why? Hundreds of millions of dollars were spent for funding a website that couldn't operate. People couldn't log on, they couldn't download, they couldn't make plans. So all this time when the government <laughs> was shut down, the website was crappy. So, so the filibuster even had the, I'm sorry, the shutdown even had the effect of distracting people from the actual debacle that was in healthcare. But the president called in the nerds, right? This was a so-called tech surge, which was used to salvage the ACA from its demise. Uh, uh, come Thanksgiving, the president was hoping and praying it would work. And ultimately, the website more or less operated. But at the same time, the next big scandal happened, and something that Mr. Weinstein knows well, is the cancellation scandal. Yes, the promise that you can keep your plan if you like it was a lie. And millions of Americans, the number is hard to pin down, but the best number I've seen is about 4 million. 4 million Americans got a letter in the mail that looked like this with the blue cross saying, because of the new healthcare law, you will no longer be insured. Go on healthcare.gov, good luck with that, and try and buy a new policy. Um, this was a big deal because the core of the president's promise unraveled without any notice. People did not see this coming. You got these letters in the mail, boom, and you know, Rich Rich had this exact same thing happen to him. So the president's promise was indeed the, the lie of the year, um, and it's far more pernicious than that. But full steam ahead. They encouraged people to enroll on Obamacare. And over the next few months, when the website was becoming fully operational, they actually managed to attract up to 8 million people to sign up. Now, this number is always, I think, it was a tablespoon of salt. Why? People don't pay their bills on Obamacare. This may come to you as a surprise, 
But if you are sick and you can get insurance and then cancel and you're done, you're never going to pay your bills. So what actually ends up happening is of these 8 million people, maybe 7 million actually keep paying their bills. What people do is they sign up, go get treatment, surgery, chemotherapy, whatever, and then they cancel the coverage and good luck collecting. Right? Good luck collecting for someone who's insolvent and who can't afford a $400,000 round of chemo. So whenever you see these numbers, always be very skeptical. People aren't actually paying for it. And the people who are signing up are the sickest and needy. A lot of these people had insurance they liked, but were forced to sign up for a policy that was more expensive and had less coverage. Let's shift back to religious liberty and talk about what are the various standards the government can use to burden religious freedom. There was a case in 1991 called Employment Division versus Smith. This was Al Smith. He was a Native American who lived in uh, uh, Oregon. And as part of his religious sacrament, he used peyote. Everyone know what peyote is? It's this hallucinogenic mushroom type thing. I'm sorry, hallucinogenic cactus, right? It's part of the Native American sacrament. Um, he was fired from his job. Uh, ironically, he was a drug counselor in all professions. But he was fired from his job, um, and then he applied for unemployment benefits from the state, and he was denied coverage. Why? Well, you were doing illegal drugs. It's a controlled substance under the law, and we're not going to give you any benefits for it. This went to the Supreme Court. Right? Can the government deny someone employment benefits if they're using this product, uh, peyote, that's against the law? And in a decision from Justice Scalia, the court held that, yes, you can deny the coverage. The law is not targeting religion. It's not singling out any religion. It says you can't use peyote, period. There's no religious bias. So Mr. Smith lost. This case proved to be very, very, very unpopular. And about two years later, President Clinton signed into law the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, RIFRA. And the purpose of RIFRA, it's a very short bill, read it to you in one sentence, and it says, if the government wants to substantially burden religious exercise, they have to have a really good reason to do it, and must do so in a very narrow way. In other words, if the government can, you know, find a way to um, uh, 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 burden religion without, you know, making such a big fuss, they got to do that. A couple years later, in a case called Bernie v. City of Flores, the Supreme Court struck down part of RIFRA, as applied to the states, basically saying, Congress cannot tell the states how to manage their own business. But RIFRA is still on the books for the federal government. And Hobby Lobby, the corporation, used RIFRA and said, wait a minute, we are a corporation, and we have a religious identity, and you cannot make us buy birth control that we find objectionable. They actually only objected to four types of birth control. They objected to basically stuff that applied after fertilization occurred. So they were fine with condoms, they were fine with the birth control pill, but not with the morning after pill. Now you may say, Josh, wait a minute. How can a corporation have a religious identity? That makes no sense, right? How could this possibly be? Well, the Hobby Lobby Corporation is a very unique business. It was founded uh, 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 by a guy named David Green back in the 70s, and he built this from basically making picture frames in his garage to a, uh, to a single store in Oklahoma City now they have uh, locations just across the map. New Jersey, the one with that one? 46. <clears throat> okay. Is there one here? Yeah, there is. Yeah. Okay, good. I, if they didn't have one here, I'd be in trouble. So they, they do have a, uh, uh, <laughs> they, they do have a Hobby Lobby in New Jersey, but they're all over the map. But still, it is not a publicly created company. It is owned by David and Barbara Green, as a husband and wife. And who's the board of directors? Their family. Indeed, this picture is, it looks like an Easter card. This is a board meeting. The board of directors is the family, and every member of the family shares the same religious identity. And in publicly traded companies, this is impossible. If anyone on the street buying shares, they all have different beliefs. And it would be impossible to say that this company has a single religious identity. Here, they all agree that providing these forms of birth control, or uh, IUDs and the uh, uh, Plan B emergency contraceptive, is bad, and they object to it. So they brought suit saying that we cannot be forced to pay for this form of birth control. Uh, uh, and, and as you can imagine, the social justice warriors and the reproductive freedom justice warriors, all these other warriors who carry no actual weapon, uh, uh, rebelled against this. So this was, these were a bunch of signs held outside the arguments of Hobby Lobby, it's one of my favorites. It says, if men could get pregnant, birth control would be 
gumbo machines and a bacon flavor. Uh, the dirty little secret is uh, the only reason why birth control requires a prescription. In other countries, you don't need a prescription for birth control. You don't. You go in the pharmacy, buy it. The reason why is because once you make birth control over the counter, insurance isn't covered anymore. And Planned Parenthood loses a lot of money. So Planned Parenthood insists on keeping birth control a prescription so it's covered by Obamacare. Dirty little secret. Should not be, you don't need it to be with a prescription. Um, the other major issue with Hobby Lobby was people saying, well, a corporation can't breathe, a corporation can't grow, they have no rights, right? This is not a this is not a this is not a person who has religious exercise. Um, this girl's dressed up as a birth control pack. Uh, <laughs> it was creative. Uh, this sign, hey Supreme Court, no boss is my bedroom. I think they would agree with that. Indeed. Hobby Lobby does not want to be in your bedroom because they don't want to fund your activity. <laughs> so this sign, I think, was not correctly placed. Uh, kind of slipped into my business. Corporations are not people, my friend. Uh, this one's my favorite. Uh, this old woman looks like a, a, a veteran of the uh, 60s uh, protest movement. Her mind's probably still there. Um, <laughs> crocheted uterus, indeed. Well, that's cool. <laughs> It is well done, isn't it? It's very good. <laughs> and I, I'm sure she brought the fabric at Joanne. I don't think she bought her, her, her yarn at Hobby Lobby. Uh, but, but she made a uterus. It says, Hobby Lobby, this uterus is for you. Oh, I forgot to mention. It was actually a campaign to mail Hobby Lobby crocheted uteruses as a sort of protest. I don't know if anyone's actually protest, but there was a, it was a website. Uh, Keep your hobbies off my ovaries, as the sign says. Uh, <laughs> Um, unfortunately, the pro-life signs are never quite as creative. I am pro-life, pro-life generation. It's, it's, it's never, our signs are never as good as their signs. Those have, I guess we have jobs, we don't have time to paint and marker and stuff, but their signs are bad. These guys, I don't know what the hell we're doing. God's law comes first, we feel the socials, Obamacare. You can't quite tell, but they're wearing kilts with a bagpipe. And it must have been like 30 degrees a day, it was actually snowing, and they're sitting there. So the case was argued by Paul Clement for the challengers. Uh, uh, and by Don Verley, the Solicitor General. Um, and the case went uh, more or less as we anticipated. Um, Justice Alito wrote the majority opinion saying that simply because you're a corporation, that doesn't mean you don't get religious services, right? You still get your free exercise rights. And you know what, government? If you think health insurance is so important, don't make the government, I'm sorry, don't make Hobby Lobby pay for it, pay for it yourself, right? If this is such an important need, why do you have to make this corporation pay for it? And um, uh, uh, I thought that was a pretty correct decision. Um, but the dissent, which was by Justice Ginsburg, who's been nodding off this picture, <laughs> was, uh, uh, she, she actually fell asleep at the State of the Union a couple of years ago. She, she claimed that she had too much wine beforehand, uh, sober as a judge indeed. But this decision, I think, kick-started what became known as the notorious RBG. Uh, this is, of course, a pun, no pun intended, on big pun, right, the notorious B.I.G., uh, who was a rapper in the 1990s. Um, and, and, and Ruth Ginsburg, I think this really went to her head. Uh, she's here with, with Katie Kirk, and she's beaming at a t-shirt with her mug on it. Uh, uh, Justice Ginsburg also likes showing off the little neck, uh, neck doilies, as I call them, these little frills she wears. Indeed, this is her majority opinion neck doily. If you ever go to a, uh, a, a hearing in the Supreme Court and see her wearing this, she has an opinion to hand out. She says it's fierce. But uh, RBG became the sort of patron saint of liberal feminism. Uh, I think she takes it a little bit too seriously. Uh, uh, but her and Nino, oh, I was about to say are, but indeed were uh, uh, excellent friends. So the reaction to how the lot was swift, the pro-life generation was happy. Um, Ms. Scrott didn't sing the wrong message blowing kisses, but we'll, we'll, uh, we'll let her slide. <laughs> but now we turn to the case that Mr. Weinstein came here to talk about which is King against Berwick. So at the outset of this talk, I discussed that there was a House bill and there was a Senate bill. There were two different bills discussing Obamacare. The House bill said what we'll do is create a single federal health care exchange. We don't trust the states to manage these insurance markets. We'll have a single health exchange. The Senate bill said, no, 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 we don't want this. That will push us towards single payer. Let's give states the opportunity to create their own exchange, and if they fail to do so or do so poorly, the feds can step in and build an exchange for them. Okay. So as it turns out, I think 36 states decided, screw you, we're not building an exchange. Only about a dozen or 14 or so states actually did so. So this is what the map looked like a couple of years ago. But there's a problem with this approach. The way the exchanges work 
is that when you go online, the price that you see is not the actual price that you pay. The government provides uh, subsidies, tax credits, directly to the insurance company to defray the cost of your Obamacare. So we have, and, and bear with me, the text here actually doesn't have any commas. So we have section 1311, says, each state shall establish an exchange. Now, Congress can't make states establish an exchange, that's unconstitutional. So the idea is, states, you do it, but if you don't, the secretary will establish it in the state, right? So if the state doesn't do it, the secretary will establish and operate such exchange within the state. Okay? Okay? But is there any difference between the types of exchanges? Okay? So here is section 36B of the ACA. It's a little bit smaller, I think project is bigger. But it says, blah, 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 subsidies will be available when you enroll in a, in a plan to an exchange established by the state. Let me say that one more time. Subsidies will be available when you're enrolled in a plan through an exchange established by the state. Now, a casual speaker of the English language would see that sentence and say, well, that means there are subsidies available in an exchange established by the state. So if the federal government establishes an exchange, there are no subsidies. All right, everyone, everyone okay with this? Okay. Yeah. This, this seems to be a fairly plausible reading of the English language. But uh, a compatriot of Mr. Weinstein was a, a benefits lawyer named Tom Christina, who lived in South Carolina. Uh, Tom uh, uh, actually bothered reading the Affordable Care Act. He's the only <laughs> one. And he was reading this, like, wait a minute. This means that when the feds have an exchange and no subsidies, it would be unaffordable. Buying insurance on the federal exchange that subsidies would be utterly unaffordable because there's no way people can afford it. These premiums are jacked up in price. So Christina's like, wow, this means the federal exchanges suck, right? I hope the states establish exchanges. But what happened next is remarkable. The federal government released a rule. And this rule said, we will have the other next slide. We will treat an exchange under 1311, that is the federal exchange, or 1321, the state exchange, exactly the same. The feds issued a rule saying we will treat identically the federal exchange and the state exchange, right? Why? Well, we think that this is consistent with the language, purpose, and structure of the ACA as a whole. The bill that no one actually read, right? <laughs> So here was this rule that told the states, okay, even if you guys don't build an exchange, we'll still give citizens in your state the subsidies. This was challenged by a group of plaintiffs organized by the Competitive Enterprise Institute. There's a guy, uh, Sam Kasdan, who's a lawyer there, and that's Jack from Halbig. Um, uh, this is Mike Carvin, who's a lawyer for the challengers, and these are the Hearsts. And they challenged this rule saying, hey, idiot, read the statute. State means state, right? State mean state. Um, they filed suits in two different federal courts in the District of Columbia and in the uh, uh, Fourth Circuit in District of Virginia. And on the same day, July 23rd, 2013, a circuit split was formed. A circuit split was formed where one court went one way and the other court went the other way, which basically guarantees people what to do. Now, I usually don't talk about this, but because Rich Weinstein's in the House, um, one of the most difficult arguments for the government is, why would this provision be here? Okay. So the challenger said that the government was trying to encourage states to establish an exchange, right? Listen, if you guys build an exchange, New Jersey, right? You guys build an exchange, your citizens get these awesome tax credits. And if you don't build an exchange, they get nothing. It sounds reasonable, right? It sounds plausible. They're trying to encourage states to do this. But every single Every single person in the Obama White House said, no, this is not the reason why, this is implausible. Absolutely no one ever thought this was how the law worked. Until, ludicrous, until Rich Weinstein, Rich, come up for a second. Really? Yeah, come on up, come on up. Rich, I want you to talk about your, I actually got the camera rolling, this is what I'm doing. Oh, great. So I want Rich, who is a, a part and parcel of this case, to explain, how did you first discover okay, Mr. So, Gruber? So, Let's talk about Gruber for a minute. So what happened was, and going back to what you were saying, in late 2013, I got one, my wife and I got one of these letters that said that your plan was wrong about the fine subsidies. And our premiums went on top of that. So uh, I really didn't pay too much attention to the law 
but once you know that kind of engaged me a little bit. So you, you watch what's going on, and you see the media is just cheering you back and forth, and the administration is just kind of lying through their teeth. So you couldn't really figure out what was going on. You know, as an amateur, as a regular person, I'm not going to know. So I decided to, you know, you see these architects and people on TV, and the architects people, they're these uh, economic wonks. I thought, you know, maybe they left the trail of breadcrumbs for me to follow. So I started researching these architects people, the Jonathan Gruber's, the uh, Dickie Manuals, the David Cutler's. And uh, the Cutler and, and I know, like, you know, people say they're just having it, but these Gruber guys seem like they like to talk a lot. And uh, first thing I realized, well, I realized it was a big tax grab, but as I'm going through Gruber videos, I see him say something that says, if, if he answered a question from the audience, and he said, if your state doesn't establish a machine, and there's no tax credit, there's no subsidy. And I just kind of made a note of that and didn't think too much about it. I thought it was interesting. I didn't understand what anybody was talking about. And that was in January of 2014. In not long after, I read a, I read something that was called uh, Taxation Without Representation. It wound up being a, a paper written by uh, Jonathan Edward and Mike Cannon, I believe. And I thought that was really interesting. And I realized that, hey, I think I have information on this. And I tried to get my Gruber video uh, for anybody that would listen. And six, after six months, nobody would listen. So in July of 2014, I believe, which is kind of right where we are when this split happened, there was an article written in the... Um, the one from Ball of Conspiracy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I saw a link to it, and I read it. And I said, son of a gun, I know what this is about. So in the comment section, I just made a comment. Hey, listen. This guy, Jonathan Gruber, is an architect, and watch this video from this one minute, and you will see what exactly they intended. Mm -hmm. And finally, somebody saw it the next day. It was a Thursday or Friday, and then my wall blew up because all of a sudden, people were paying attention to what I had found and was trying to get it, get it to people as quick as they could. I didn't realize it, but I'll be here for the Cambridge, the, the Cambridge Turtle case. And from there, it just got, for my life, it got really weird from that point forward. So thank you, Rich. That's why I'm here. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, he's, being, he's being modest. I mean, uh, Rich is being modest. He basically had the smoking gun of this ACA architect on camera, not once, but twice, saying the exact same thing. That the reason why the law was structured this way was to encourage states to build these exchanges, that they failed to build these exchanges, there would be no subsidies. And Rich was trying to email everyone, like Hannity and Fox News, and no one returned his call. I think you may have actually emailed me also, and I think I should have replied. But uh, 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 it was, I think you did, but it, 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 no, no comment. But we're, we're, we're all friends now. Uh, but, the, but the fact is, once he put that comment on the Vol Conspiracy website, uh, someone from the competitive enterprises, with Ryan Radia, read it. And Ryan put on the CEI blog, and from there it went big. And Rich told me this anecdote, which I put in the book, was that he was at Wawa having a sandwich one day. Uh, and then Rush Limbaugh is talking about him on the air. And, and it's like, you know, this guy Gruber, you know, this, you know, uh, this, this MIT genius has been, you know, brought down by some guy from Philadelphia. Um, uh, uh, no tinfoil hat, but, uh, but uh, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good guy. Um, uh, and he provided this evidence that, you know, maybe it wasn't absolutely insane to think that this was on the mind of someone. Now, how did this provision established by the state find its way to the ACA? We don't actually know. Um, the way these laws are drafted is that they're entire teams of professional drafters. And this specific phrase established by the state was not a one-time error. It was used seven times. And it wasn't inadvertently inserted. Why? Because if you go back to the section number, I'll show you. You see the section number surrounding it, right? Subsection B2A, subsection 1311. Those numbers were actually updated. So someone actually updated the text surrounding this provision, okay? You know, you update the section numbers as you as you go through the bill. So this was actually updated. So this was not a glitch. This was not a typo. This was not a speako, as Mr. Gruber would once say. Um, this was a deliberate change. So when did the Supreme Court to decide what is the meaning of established by the state? Once again, it was argued that conservative signs are just not very good. Obamacare is always meant to be legal. Bad signs, right? Don't take my care. The far more effective signs are by the Obamacare defenders. All these numbers, 
New Jersey, two hundred and thirty-seven thousand dollars would be good health care, right? If the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the challenger, the subsidies would cut off. At some point within a year, right away, unclear when, but they'd cut off. <coughs> Insurance would become unaffordable in most states of the union. You could not buy it. It would, I hate the phrase, unravel the entire thing. In fact, Paul Krugman today, Rich sent me this tweet earlier before I lost my laptop. Uh, Paul Krugman actually said, quote, Obamacare is starting to unravel. So I had the New York Times oh, yeah. 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 I, I blogged about it on the laptop. Send me uh, a book. I'll drop one off the New York Times tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Krugman. Um, so we have I think this it's case. a single, single payer system. Oh, that's what they actually want, right? <clears throat> so the case was argued again by Michael Carbon for the challengers uh, and by Solicitor General really for the government that was in the court that day. Um, and things were kind of weird, right? The Chief Justice was very quiet. He didn't ask many questions. So what happened, once again, the Chief Justice broke my heart. In the decision of King against Burwell by 6-3 vote, the Chief Justice held that the government was correct. That even though the plain meaning of established by the state is, quote, strong, if we look at the purpose of the ACA, the purpose of the, Rich is not said, the purpose of the ACA is to improve, not to spread health insurance, and that is how we will read the law. Justice Scalia gave what would be his last dissent from the bench, where he said that all the normal rules of interpretation go out the window because of Obamacare. All the normal rules disappear. In fact, Scalia wrote my favorite line, we should start calling the law SCOTUS care, that this is now a product of the Supreme Court of the United States. This was the second major Supreme Court case. The final case, and I'll wind down to your, your Jersey hands are bouncing for questions, <laughs> uh, we start fist pumping them in, I don't know why, involved the nuns, the little sisters of the poor. Um, these are a group of amazing people. Um, their entire mission is to tend to the elderly. I mean, these are really good people. Imagine giving your life to help these old and sick people. Um, I actually had the good fortune of having lunch with them. Um, after the case was argued, they put together this lunch a few blocks away. I walked in this room full of nuns. I'm from Jewish, but I didn't nuns, right? But I walked in this room full of nuns. It was like a casting call for the sound of music. Uh, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> how do you solve a problem like Scalia? I don't know. But unfortunately, <laughs> Justice Scalia, who I think was a good nominee for Pope, uh, uh, the last go around, uh, was not there. Justice Scalia passed away. Uh, so they were down to eight. And this was a picture of the little sisters in this cafeteria of the Supreme Court. You can imagine these nuns sitting there. You have these guys with full white hoods and everything else walking around. It was it was a remarkable sight. I was at the court that day. I was sworn to the SCOTUS bar that morning, right before the Obamacare case was being argued, which was very fortuitous. Paul Clement and uh, Noel Francisco argued for the challengers, and really argued again for the uh, government. Um, and the scene outside that day, uh, as the nuns were walking down the stairs, it was a scene I had never seen before. Because usually you have people protesting the street, you have hippies, immigration, anti death penalty. It was full of nuns. It was full of nuns. There must have been 100 nuns in the, in, the, in the street. They were saying, God bless America. No one was kneeling, I promise. Um, <laughs> there it is, people forgot that. Uh, it was really a really remarkable scene. I think I'm somewhere over there. Maybe walk down the set. But, um, <laughs> um, no, always in the background, right? <laughs> But it was remarkable since these nuns were giving the speech. This is a uh, Sister Lorraine, uh, uh, sorry, Mother Provincial Lorraine. I don't get anything wrong. I get slapped with the yardstick. Um, uh, but, but she was uh, uh, giving this remarkable speech. Um, but then something crazy happened, right? The question with the nuns was, can the government, you know, require them to engage in this process that insurance is provided through their plan? Okay. The answer to that question is yes or no, right? Either it's legal or not legal. The Supreme Court chose, chose door number three. So they asked for homework, okay? The Supreme Court said, hey, you guys, we've heard your arguments. Uh, we can't really make a decision. What about something else, right? Can you think of another way that maybe you can provide birth control to women without burdening the nuns? Uh, and the parties basically replied saying, um, no. <laughs> Did that stop the Supreme Court? No. So in May 20th of 2016, the court issues this order saying, hey, the parties came to us and said there was a compromise. Go figure it out, you guys. Go back to the lower courts and deal with it yourselves. Um, this was a total and complete myth because there is no way of working it out, and these cases are currently back on remand for the lower courts. Oh, this is a good sign. Which one? Oh, Those are good signs. Oh, my God, yes. I'll have none of it, right? That's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> and the hashtag was let them serve. I mean, this was an amazing scene. You have all these nuns with all the different garbs uh, uh, standing there in the plaza willing to sign up. It was 
it was really remarkable because usually you'd have these scruffy kids and you know people interns whatever but here it actually had nuns and i think they busted the school kids you know the girls in the skirts and the, the uniforms it was a, it was it was pretty impressive uh, to, to witness in person i'm going to end my talk here um the first book i wrote was called unprecedented the second book i wrote was called unravel i think the third book should I get so far, I would call it undone. Uh, because the AC, as it stands now, is frankly not stable. And I am not confident that this law can survive for very long. So there's a question mark. How long after the uh, uh, inauguration, did, uh, I think we're off here, 2017, uh, 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 should this last? Um, I'm going to stop here because I know you're all advancing to ask questions. But there was a lot of information. I hope you do buy a copy of my book. Uh, uh, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, Thank you all so much. Okay. I think you, you interjected, sir, on the right. Yeah, you had a question. You? Yeah, yeah well, sure. Uh, well, the first one, uh, <laughs> I have several. And you mentioned that if you want to get something passed, uh, be sure to ha have them the national parks uh, in it. The other way to get something passed that you didn't get passed the first time is to pay off the insurance companies. And wasn't that part of why we didn't have uh, those two people objecting on TV to Obamacare? Yeah, so the insurance companies made what I called a pact with the devil, or a Faustian pact, right? They said to the government, okay, Obama, if you pass law demanding that people buy our product and govern subsidies to make it cheaper for them, and we get all this money, we're in bed with you. <laughs> the arrogance. Yeah. The arrogance of these people to think that they wouldn't get burned by this deal. They thought, oh man, this is awesome, right? The government's going to make people buy our product and give us subsidies. Like, who? It's like a rent seeking bonanza. Like, who wouldn't want that? So, okay, we are literally three years in, and this thing's not working. So after state after state, insurance companies saying, okay, it's just not working. We're going to exit this market. Three years. I thought it would take a decade to implode. I, I, this is beyond my wildest imagination. After they got their money. Uh, one more question. Uh, the Chief Justice caved in on the taxation issue. Mm -hmm. There are different legends and stories about why he caved in. I think one of the speakers here said that uh, if you read the last half of the opinion, he was going to overturn it. It looked like if you read the first half, he didn't. Uh, do you have any information well, about Well, if you that? buy a copy of my first book, you'll get that well, as well. That's <laughs> so the short answer. That's what I'm going to do. Oh, good. Buy both of them. But tell me anyway. But the, the short answer is there were rumors that the Chief Justice, you know, um, changed his vote like the week before when he was scrambling. I, that's what I, when I've heard, that's not what happened. He decided fairly early on that. He wanted to uphold the laws of tax, but he made the decision to spend about 30 pages writing about the Commerce Clause and put in all this language about how this is not valid in the Commerce Clause, but we'll uphold it as a tax. The usual framework is if we can find a way to uphold the law, we don't talk about all the other ways we may find to strike it down. <coughs> so he was trying to lay down some what's called dicta, some sort of you know, helpful information for the future. Um, uh, how does it work? It was arrogant. It was stupid. He thought that, you know, I'll be this smart, you know, King Solomon, right? Where I'm gonna bisect the baby, right? But the baby didn't exist. There wasn't a tax. There was nothing to cut in half. And um, I think there was a serious uh, 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 error in the ways of the Chief Justice, and he created some dark fire. Uh, I'm a sorry. I'm a little bit on the skirt. Uh, the, the week, the week or two after that case was argued, uh, Justice Scalia spoke in Long Island. I don't know if he was here. The Federalist Society. Uh, Which case? King and Burwell? Uh, yeah. And um, they already had the conference. And Scalia didn't say what happened, but judging from everything he said, it seemed definitely this is going down. I mean, he, he was very clear about how, you know, the Commerce Clause, is, we can't just string anything up the flagpole, et cetera. He seemed like definitely this thing's going down. Mm -hmm. And so something happened sometime after that. Yeah, and, and, and also, the, the, the word, you know, the, the secret word is, or what happened this week was that Kennedy, the Kennedys uh, spent a long time trying to get the Chief Justice back, that he had changed his vote. 
which is why they, they supposedly left the opinion, the dissenting opinion sounds like a majority opinion, because it was written by the Chief Justice himself, and he wanted his words to be there. Um, and, uh, and he wouldn't stick it to him. And then the last part of the dissent, I think it was written by Kennedy or Scalia, I forget which, and it was sort of their, this is now a dissent. Yeah, I, I, I'm not a fan of that theory. Um, the, the reason why is there's some parts of the dissent which say it's not a dissent. But the truth is, at that point, the opinions were five justice, so it wasn't a dissent. It was actually concurring in judgment. So uh, from what I've talked to, I've talked to a lot of people, uh, the chief made a decision about a month afterwards. So the case was argued March 26, 2012, and I don't know when Nino came to speak to you guys, but about a month later, the chief decided that he was going to do his thing, and so that by the time it came down to June, everything was settled. Um, there was a lot of contention in the court, to the point of you know, sore, sore contention, um, and I think the chief justice has proven himself to be a, uh, uh, a bit too smart for the court, or at least he's much smarter than he's not nearly as smart as he thinks he is. Put it that way. Need a case oh, yeah. for waiting. So, so, so on your on your point about the deal that the um, insurance company made, when there's now discussion about them losing money or the defense and, and all of that, just as sort of a simple sort of Freud question, how sorry do you feel? None. <laughs> I am the greatest shot of Freud in the world. I am so happy to be failing. But, but, I have to temper that, Lita. You don't have to temper it. Is that once they go, we're stuck with national health care, right? Part of me should be rooting for the exchanges to succeed, because that's our last bastion against national health care. But once they fail, that brings in the public option. You really don't think there's any further negotiation or anything like that? No, no. I mean, the pro... If you have insurance from your employer, right, you're not losing them. But what's going to happen is your rates are going to go up. Why? Because now have to compensate for all the losses to the Obamacare exchanges. These are money losers, right? I, I know liberals love to think of these corporations that have these never-ending baskets of money they can just simply draw from. That's what we do with the Treasury. Uh, um, corporations <laughs> don't have that. So if they're losing money to the Obamacare exchanges, guess what? Your employer plan, your premium is going up. Your network shrinking. Your deductibles are going bigger. Um, all this is a way of getting at is that now both Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton have endorsed the public option. Uh, my friend Seth Chandler at the University of Houston described the public option as a Trojan horse with windows, right? There's no mystery about what this <laughs> is. There's no mystery. This is simply a way to put insurance companies out of business because you cannot compete against the government. You can't underprice them. Uh, uh, no matter what you charge, the government can charge less. This will be basically what Bernie Sanders wants, Medicare for all, let people buy into Medicare. Uh, um, and, and then you'll have a national health care system in the works. Mm -hmm. Mr. Weinstein. And, and, and no gentleman, I looked at somebody else, a guy named Jake Packer, who yeah. is the father of the public option, and he himself said, he would call this truth from what you see with Heyer, while talking about the public option, and he said, frankly, it's been a Trojan horse. It's right there. Yeah. And so, so windows. Correct. So, <laughs> so either if the, if the exchanges uh, Jonathan Gruber once said in two different settings, if the Affordable Care Act fails, there's no way to deal with the flood in single payer. And in a different setting, he said, that's ridiculous. The Affordable Care Act fails, that's, that's dumb. The Affordable Care Act has to succeed to get to single payer. So he basically said, if it succeeds to go to single payer, if it fails to go to single payer, it, it, there's really nowhere else. You know, F.A. Hayek wrote a book about this. It's called The Road to Serfdom. <laughs> and we're on that road anyway. Anyone ask first first time question? Yeah. So um, there's been a lot of talk, and I think uh, it's, it's kind of it's not mutual, but or mutual exclusive. But you're what I would say um, part of the judicial engagement uh, faction of attorneys or professors that like Mitchell really pointed out before, and a more active role for judges as opposed to being judicial activists. And then there's another wing of conservative thought that I guess you've all been in, Senator Mike Lee, pushing for a greater uh, responsibility by Congress to assume the powers of legislating as opposed to federal bureaucracies, put down bureaucracies through the agencies. So would you say that there's more of a chance of the Congress taking more responsibility to take that power back or judges shedding Chevron deference and you know, essentially judging these rules based on the language of statutes or the Constitution. 
one excellent and deep question. So I think the answer to both of your questions is going to resolve in about, what, 35 days? I don't say that. In the event that Hillary Clinton wins and that she appoints a justice to the Supreme Court, I think we will see justices willing to embrace unlimited deference for agencies. I think the project of a libertarian judicial engagement becomes very hard when you have a guy like Merrick Garland who makes people want to say, man, how can you refer to government today? Well, how, what, what deference can I give to the government more than I did yesterday? Um, your second question about Congress, I wish Congress would take more authority over their own lawmaking power. But for Democrat-controlled government, it's not necessary. What they want is to write a blank check to an agency, let the agency fill in whatever they like, and they have no accountability for it. Um, I wish there were 100 Mike Lees in the U.S. Senate. We would have a much greater union if that were the case. But instead, we'd be like, you know, Chuck Schumer would be the majority leader um, in some time, uh, and who was very much intent to write these omnibus laws with no action in Congress. So. I don't know how important this is. Uh, like yourself, I was at, uh, well, first of all, Justice Scalia spoke at this museum, and I tell you, I went to it here uh, about two years ago, and it was fabulous. But also, the week he died, he spoke at the Economic Club in New York City. And uh, not during his uh, talk, but during one of the questions, someone asked him about the Chevron case. And I forget what the votes were on the original Chevron case. He nice. said, if it comes up again, we go the other way. Or at least I would go the other way. Is what he said. Yeah, so, so the Chevron decker, for those of you who don't know, it's a case from the 1980s which says if Congress passes a statute that's ambiguous, as long as the agency's interpretation is reasonable, the courts will listen to it. Even if it's wrong, as long as it's not unreasonable. And that was how they got this contraceptive mandate. This is how now uh, uh, the government argues that you know uh, the Telecommunications Act of 1936 now gives the government the power to regulate the internet as a common carrier, the same way they regulate telephone companies. Utterly insane. But Justice Scalia, later in his life, towards the end, had second givings by deference of Chevron. And at, had he lived long enough, I think he would have gotten rid of Chevron, got rid of our deference, all of it. He would have all been there. And that's it. So once upon a time, there was a congressman who nobody knew about, who I liked, and I don't like any more of him because he was a legal son, but Paul Ryan, back when he was a nobody, had a uh, had this roadmap future. And the roadmap for the future provided for um, his solutions to basically retool Social Security, Medicare, and to provide full uh, universal health care coverage. Um, and also pay off the entire national debt within 20 years, as scored by the, uh, the Office of Management and Budget. Not Office of Management, uh, CBA, right. So, um, and, and, and the idea was that essentially the government would give a premium check to all citizens, and that premium check would then be put into the private insurance market to buy policies that would be a cafeteria plan that suits your individual needs. Now you'd have the doctor-patient relationship restored, etc. And I thought it was a pretty brilliant idea at the time, and it seems to have gone nowhere. But I, is, is there any reason that that kind of Especially now that we're supposing, if for some reason we do have a Republican Congress that decides they want to uh, repeal Obamacare and we have a Republican president, who, who, who would that be? Happen? <laughs> well, that's a good question. The answer good. So I think the short answer is I mean, President elect Trump <laughs> has made very clear that he doesn't want to cut entitlements. Paul Ryan has nothing. Trump has said, I will not cut Social Security, I will not cut Medicaid or Medicare. But Obamacare, he says he wants to repeal the yeah, price. Right. <laughs> I mean, look, you don't, you don't have to, yeah. you can't believe anything the guy says, true. But I don't have an under oath like you did. Whatever, whatever works. <laughs> yeah. um, I mean, look, and I think I need to leave this on where we got to get going. I think the short answer is unless you eliminate the filibuster, Obamacare is not going anywhere. Democrats will, this is a third rail. Democrats will not let this one go unless you can get over the 60 vote hump. But it was passed under reconciliation. So, so, so you technically you don't use, they can't have a at least parts of it. So you could use reconciliation to eliminate certain parts of it, but not the entirety of it, right? Um, uh, but the consequence of that is you have this hollowed out shell 
and you'll still need 60 votes to pass something new. All right, so you can gut it for this one. Last, last question. question. One last, last question. question. Uh, wouldn't the funding still work if, if Trump is elected? I don't think he doesn't have a shot at being elected. If Trump is elected, don't you think they fund? And, and, we, and we still have control of the Senate. Wait, isn't the fun, uh, defunding still a possibility? You would need to get over 60. And the reason why, I mean, assuming maybe you can do the reconciliation, but it's complicated, you can't, you can't do. But most of Obamacare is a permanent appropriation. You basically, you, we need to repeal the law. You're funding it on time. This is why the true strategy would Permanent appropriation? Is the appropriation you would need to start in the House? No. You would need to repeal parts of the law to do the funding. We read the book. You know, <laughs> thank right. you all so much. And, and exactly, read the book. I was about to turn it off, but it's not mine. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for coming. Thank you so much.